Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guys, a phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, we're talking about season three, episode six, titled The Shadow in the Dark. Spooky. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to answer everyone's questions right now about how weird this episode was. It originally premiered on October 31st, 1986. It's a Miami Vice Halloween episode. And that's why it's so weird. <laughs> yep. They saved it up. Just they, they saw the date that they were going to be on Halloween. And they're like, we got to get a scary episode in. Mm-hmm. It's not so much scary as it is just kind of really weird. <laughs> it's more eerie. <laughs> yeah. There you go. <laughs> like, not scary, not weird, just eerie. <laughs> the writer is Chuck Adamson. Now, we've seen Chuck before. He wrote, give a little, take a little, the Home Invaders, which the same house from Home Invaders is in this episode. Maybe he lives in that so. house. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Maybe it's his house. <laughs> and The Fix. So what we know about this guy, and this came up when we talked about him and give a little take a look, is that he's a retired major crimes police officer from Chicago. And you see all of his episodes are about Crime, evil criminals breaking into houses and stuff makes a little sense i mean this episode the plot closely resembles the michael mann movie manhunter from 1986 also there's no so, coincidence is... that it's a michael mann movie <laughs> <laughs> you know it's the first appearance of hannibal lecter and based on the book Red Dragon, which would eventually become its own movie. Do you think that there's a chance that this episode of Miami Vice ruined the movie? Because the Wikipedia reports that the budget for the movie was $15 million and it only made $8.6 million at the box office. No, I just think it was not a good movie. <laughs> this episode is directed by Christopher Crow, which I don't have any notes on him because he won't direct any other a- episode of Miami Vice. Before we get started, I can check in so what's going to each other's lives. And hey, John's back, guys. We missed him last I week. Am. My uh, piss poor music rundown will be forgotten soon enough. <laughs> yeah you know it is very rarely that my work gets in the way of doing this podcast and it's even more rare that i work on a sunday which is when we record this fortunately certain sandwich shops uh (laughs) wouldn't let us turn off their water in order to to do what i needed to do i'm not gonna name names it's just a small Popular sandwich shop that's a <laughs> national brand uh, wouldn't let me turn their water off. So I had to get up at four o'clock in the morning on a Sunday so that they didn't lose any money from all the sandwiches they were going to sell that day. <laughs> or not sell, you know. Yeah, I'm not I'm not at all bitter about this. <laughs> John, we're happy you're back because we have someone that will take guest stars and music seriously and actually be able to give us good information. Because last week, everyone found out really quickly. I was like, yeah, then there was this guy. He was there, too. He did some shit. (laughs) (laughs) He was in a show once. (laughs) You recognize him. You know, he's that guy. You know, that one guy. (laughs) John, you missed a really good episode last week. So I'm sorry that you did miss it. It was um, a very dark episode of Miami Vice. And speaking of dark episodes, let's go talk about this weird, dark Halloween special episode of Miami (laughs) Vice. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I really enjoy doing that. It's the Halloween episode. I really enjoy doing that because it makes me think of it. Melissa, we were talking about this before we started recording is that in the 80s, the Halloween episodes were a big deal. All the networks would have yes. every show airing that night would have some Halloween themed episode. Or at least that whole week. That was like my favorite part of network TV in the 80s was every show, yeah. especially Roseanne, would do like a huge Halloween episode. So, yeah, I miss that. They don't do that yeah, nowadays. You're right, especially with the sitcom shows. Like it was always big to have the holiday episodes. And now you definitely got that feel from this episode, too, that it was filmed in like a scary movie style. Now Nowadays, if you want to see the holiday episode of a TV show, you got to tune in three months in advance. Yeah. (laughs) You know, because they don't air Thanksgiving or Christmas or Halloween episodes the week of that holiday. No, because it's all holiday specials. Yeah, they (laughs) air it in August. (laughs) So we open up this episode 
And it's like, ah, Florida. This is the Florida I know. Cocaine is, in fact, a hell of a drug. (laughs) We just have a man. This guy's clearly nuts. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Just walking down the road, hands up in the air, making his mouth look like he's a fish out of water. He's like acting like he's trying to grab um, something. uh, I I really thought like through the first like 30 seconds, like this is a performance piece, you know, like (laughs) is he going to start it looked like they were filming a music Doing video weird or something. Dances. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> See this man walking around, arms in the air, like he's trying to catch a ghost or something. First of all, he walks down a drawbridge that's up. Yeah. Like comes on the other like, what the hell? <laughs> you would think that people would notice this man as he walked down the street with his pant legs duct taped, wearing rubber gloves, with his arms straight up in the air, walking down a drawbridge. Maybe that's just Miami. <laughs> that's why i was like it must be florida no yep. one notices no this. one notices it. it's florida <laughs> that's just florida man <laughs> he stops in front of a house and i mentioned in the opening like it's clearly the same house from the home invaders i distinctly remember it because there's a moment where castillo throws a chair through one of those plate glass windows mm-hmm. by those the pool big, huge windows that go out to the pool it just happens to be that the same writer of that episode also wrote this episode just uh, just throwing it out there. Like I said, I think he lives in it. <laughs> His house. <laughs> it's Miami Vice. Let's re- recycle actors and writers and uh, houses. And hey, it, they don't have a very big budget. we can use. <laughs> even if they just keep reusing alligators, even if they die, they just keep reusing them. <laughs> Stuffed. <laughs> <laughs> well, he stops at this house. He goes inside and he watches a couple sleep for a while then he goes down and gets a knife and i'm thinking like okay that's where this episode starts this is why vice is going to be involved because it's going to be a murder but instead of killing the couple and and this episode making sense why vice would be involved he decides to grill up a steak yeah make a snack (laughs) all that walking made him hungry (laughs) then i'm like no he's not making a steak this is getting even weirder because then he sits down with the meat and he starts rubbing flour raw, right? all over his face. And I'm back to like, oh, it's just Florida. Yeah, Florida. <laughs> it's Well, let's be fair. I mean, maybe he's trying to make like a chicken fried steak, you know. <laughs> he's he's got to bread the, the meat. And it's not the easiest thing to make. And so maybe he just read the recipe wrong. <laughs> and then after we see him frying up, <laughs> getting ready to fry up his steak, we go to the opening credits. I want to point out that this very strange man that we just watched do weird things to a steak. <laughs> uh, he is his character is actually based on a serial killer named Richard Trenton Chase, who was uh, also known as the Vampire of Sacramento, and he used to eat raw meat, raw animal meat. And drink animal blood. They also used to like wear tinfoil hats and stuff that he used to say protected his heart from shrinking. So, <laughs> so he was like the Grinch. Uh, <laughs> apparently, so so a little bit of the weirdness, I guess we have to blame on that. And then also the guy playing him uh, was never in anything special, so we have to. We just uh, ignore that. <laughs> yes, let's talk about that guy. <laughs> Well, I've I think never it was heard... in a Bible movie once. <laughs> I've never heard of the vampire killer, so that just does. And I'll say this: this this wasn't a very good episode, but it did creep me out. Yeah, it was creepy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> now that's not adding, that's not helpful with the creep factor. Yeah, it's based but... on a real serial killer from Sacramento that used to drink blood. That's creepy. <laughs> <laughs> when we come back from the opening credits, we're back at the house that the weirdo man, this the shadow man, <laughs> the flower <was> man. <laughs> Flower man, that's what I'm gonna call him. <laughs> yep. The duo pulls up in Tubbs Caddy, comes walking up to Castillo, and Castillo's basically like, You deal with this bullshit. Yeah, they're like, Why are so many people here? He's like, I don't know, you figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> and then Lieutenant Ray Gilmore comes walking up. Now Ray, Ray does you know, he sells this part as being an officer that is so involved that he's lost his mind. And you can tell right away that there is something not right with this man. He talks about that. There's been a crime spree. Ten houses have been broken into in the neighborhood. That the only thing stolen from this house and this burglary was pants. And then I started asking, so then why is Vice here? Because they need those yeah. pants. <laughs> <laughs> They're low on wardrobe. They've not stolen enough pants from suspects, apparently. <laughs> They're going to give them to Stan. That's why. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> 
He clearly wears any <laughs> pants you give him. They don't fit him right. <laughs> so Greg Gilmore, played by Jack the Bow. Uh, he also played Clarence in the movie Escape from Alcatraz. And he was in a bunch of Clint Eastwood movies, Any Which Way You Can, Sudden Impact, City Heat. And he was also in 48 Hours, Lethal Weapon, and Action Jackson. Damn, that's a, a list. Theme. Was he like, the, uh-huh. I think he was a policeman in Action Jackson. I something. don't know. I, yeah, I, I think I, I can't place him. I think he was like his boss or something. Oh, yeah. Either way, that's a so. that's a stretch there. 48 Hours, Lethal Weapon, Action Jackson. Like, yeah. That's a, that's a sad Saturday night. Exactly. We probably, oh, well, yeah. I mean, we saw it. So we've, we've seen a couple of those in movie night. So. <laughs> the crime scene is a typical, it's almost like a serial killer crime scene, not a burglary crime scene, but we know that the killer is kind of crazy. We see that Ray is totally obsessed with catching this man too, because they're looking at the crime scene. There's some drawings on the wall. We find out that he's hit a bunch of houses and stolen some random stuff and then he always goes into the kitchen first you know and then he leaves out the steak and flour so that's actually something he does every single time through this whole conversation you see just how obsessed lieutenant gilmore is yeah he's like already all sweaty too yeah (laughs) (laughs) like you said he leaves the flour and the steak out every time so how is he always picking houses that have steak in their (laughs) fridges everyone has steak. it's it's miami they're rich they got steak in their fridges ready to go (laughs) so are are vegetarians safe he's not gonna bother any vegetarians see we're good he'd never come to our house what's he gonna do with that tofu we have in the refrigerator (laughs) (laughs) that's when he's gonna murder you you didn't have steak damn it (laughs) the hell is this block of stuff you have in your I also want to point out that, you know, this shows the difference in police work because obviously he took a bite of the steak. So, it, you know, these days, any DNA. good CSI, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they'd have had him in like 20 minutes. Yeah, they'd have like denture, like prints taken out of her with his teeth look like. And I've seen Criminal Minds. I know. <laughs> <laughs> the next thing that we go to is we head downtown and vice. So I guess what's happening here, and that's what we learn when we meet Detective Cahill in this scene, is that Cahill comes in, they've known each other for a while, and that we find out that downtown has asked Vice to work on this case. We see at the end when Castillo pulls up and says that Gilmore doesn't actually want the Vice team to work on it, but downtown said that they had to assign someone from Castillo's unit. And of course, Castillo is going to pick tubs and crockett to work on it but what the duo are doing here in downtown is they're l- looking through all the back cases of burglaries there and then they're getting ready to leave it's late at night and ray just comes storming in and he's pissed and he's like you need to finish all these look back to all these dates like 1978 and stay late even if you get locked go talk to security and get a key from them and and at first i didn't understand like why are they listening to this guy it's like oh that's right he's lieutenant yeah ray gilmore he's technically their boss so he, they're getting lent out to him and he does not like them no or anybody i don't think but. <laughs> <laughs> he, he says like are you guys afraid of hard work and my thought was like yeah doesn't he know <laughs> yeah i mean Stop yeah they are it. so <laughs> really that's oh. why they're vice <laughs> <laughs> I also thought uh, Gilmore and Tubbs were going to go fisticuffs there for a minute. <laughs> Tubbs is not about, it's like, dude, it is fucking late. It's, I'm, I'm yeah, not jumping I'm not around anymore. Like, no. yeah, like, <laughs> 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 the gist that we get is that they pretty much worked all night. They're going through all the cases. And the next morning we see him at a restaurant. They're getting breakfast. It's either breakfast or lunch. That they're getting. Yeah. And Tubbs is clearly drinking a root beer float. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, my first like, is that a root beer float or is that like a beer with a straw? Which is probably worse, actually, than him. What is he, like 10? His dad took him out to breakfast and he gets a root beer float. Like, what? Crockett's telling Tubbs about a story about a man that he had tracked down that was stealing stuff from old men. And in the middle of that yeah. story... Sorry, not in the middle. At the end of that story, he says... Yeah, yeah, Crockett's Crockett's sitting there like, yeah, I arrested the burglar once. That makes me an expert. (laughs) I mean, and the guy fell out of a a balcony. That's how he got him. He didn't even actually (laughs) crack the case. (laughs) He, like, broke his back. (laughs) And Crockett says, that's who we should go talk to him because all 
Because they all know each other. Know, all know the each weirdos other. that are into creepy things like men's pants and old men, <laughs> they all congregate together <laughs> and talk about it. And right when they're getting up, getting ready to leave, Ray just comes busting in, slaps an envelope on the counter, sits down in a chair in the corner. The note says, basically, if, if I was you, if I was working this case, I'd stop. It's from the burglar, obviously. No, no, that's not from the burglar. That's Ray no, saying that's how... No, that's from Ray. That's from that's Ray. Ray saying he that? He handed them a note to talk about how much he didn't like yes. them working the case and how he didn't want to work with them. <laughs> so it was like, I'm really yeah. pissed off. I'm working with you. Like, he didn't think they could do their job yeah, like, and they were like mediocre, right? And then that's what it was, right? He was mad they were working it. He didn't want to work with them, but he was being built, forced to. So he was like a kid. I'm pissed off at you. Here's a note. Read it. I'm going to sit here with my arms crossed while you look at me. Yeah. While you read it, and then he's like, okay, let's go see who your friend is. Ray doesn't even say anything. He slaps yeah. down the envelope. But like high school, like passing notes. Like, can you imagine? Like, he's he's sitting in this car and he's writing, I think you guys stink. You guys are no fun. <laughs> You're a dude. And then butt. he folds it up and go, Yeah, exactly. You're a poofy butt. He goes and gives him a note. <laughs> That's what he did, yeah. You know, I, I was just thinking at this point, like, why doesn't someone just punch Gilmore? Yeah. <laughs> well, they head out to go see Georgie, the the man that Crockett busted. Just call him what he is. He's an old pervert. He's an old man pervert. <laughs> <laughs> and they head over to this. Is is it a gym? It's like a rehabilitation center. I think or it's a, just a gym. He just works with old people. Yeah. And Georgie's in a wheelchair because <laughs> he fell. Mm-hmm. The, the great Crockett <laughs> because burglar that's bust. a good because that's a good job for a guy that used to beat up <laughs> old guys. <laughs> why don't you help? Why don't you work the gym with old people? <laughs> They clearly didn't do background checks back then. <laughs> Georgie tells a story about a guy he knew that used to break into penthouses. And then Ray's like, yeah, you know what happened to that guy? He's he killed. He cut up someone and now he's in jail. He cut up a mother and a daughter. And then Ray goes running over and throws Georgie out of his wheelchair and has to be subdued by Crockett and Tubbs. And Crockett cocks his fist back like he's going to punch Ray. And then he just stops and pulls his gun out of his holster and Tubbs takes Ray so off the of roof. punching him, I'm going to shoot him. <laughs> 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 That's better. <laughs> but Ray is nuts. He's I mean, out of his mind. Yeah, like, first of all, can we talk about that there's yeah. got to be more than one burglar that strikes penthouses? All he says is like, I used to know a guy who liked penthouses. He's like, yeah, you know what happened to him? Like, is there only one guy in all of Miami that strikes penthouses? <laughs> the penthouse bandit. <laughs> so George is played by Timothy Carhart. He had reoccurring roles on CSI and 24. So George could probably solve this case pretty quick. <laughs> yeah, now. Um, <laughs> he was also in a bunch of different sci-fi shows like Quantum Leap and a bunch of TV movies. Uh, but what we would know him from are movies like Ghostbusters and The Hunt for Red October, Beverly Hills Cop 3. Um, <laughs> Sorry, three. <laughs> yeah, you know, the good one. Um, <laughs> the thing that's interesting about Timothy Carhart is he has two very minor roles that actually were pretty big as far as the movie themselves. And the movie Witness played an undercover cop who gets murdered at the beginning, very beginning of the movie. And it's what kind of kicks off the plot to the movie. So then in the movie Thelma and Louise, he plays a drunk man who gets shot by Louise, played by Susan Sarandon, as he attempts to rape Thelma played by Gina Davis, which kind of kicks off their whole crime spree. Wow. So this guy, he's actually mixed up in a lot of stuff from like the late 80s through the late 90s. If you're paying attention uh-huh. to pop culture, you've, you've probably seen this guy. Yeah. I didn't pay attention to it, yeah. apparently. <laughs> I'm like, I've seen all those things. I remember that. <laughs> you might remember from Black Sheep. He was in that movie as well. I did remember that from Thelma Louise, but uh-huh. he's a perverted rapist. He just plays a pervert and everything. <laughs> 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 they get Ray downstairs, and the police are actually arresting Ray. So they're putting him into the police car. Castillo is telling, sorry, Crockett asked Castillo. It's like, do you want me to be easy on him in my report? And it's like, Crockett, did you just ask him to fake a report? No, I just meant like, should I write it up like like George egged him on more or something yeah like as in lie on my report eh. <laughs> clearly the clearly the guy in the wheelchair was falling out of the wheelchair and all he was doing was trying to grab the wheelchair and catch him <laughs> so right now we see ray and he is so serious 
about a guy who has, at this point, uh, the only crime he's committed, stealing pants and fondling meat. <laughs> hey, you know what? Those the, meat the, fondlers are the worst. They go from that. The, to- the, this is a major crime. They have two different departments working on this. I know. I know. The meat fondler case. <laughs> but screw those hookers that work over on Hooker Alley. We're not going to help them out. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta catch the pant thief. Hey, you know what? He's messing with people's dinner. They were gonna make that damn steak, and now they can't because he's fondled it all up. <laughs> Ruined it. The last thing that Castillo says is that Ray's off the case, but the duo are still Obviously. gonna work. It. Yeah. <laughs> There's a brief stop over at the precinct where the duo are still looking through paperwork, and Switek pops in and says that there's a police report out there right now that a prowler is hit is been reported at a house and it's near the neighborhood that they've been working. So the duo hop into the car and they head out to go check in on this prowler. They happen to show up at the same time as uh, the two meat other... fondlers chuck again. <laughs> <laughs> they happen to show up at the same time to Miami PD cars show up and then they hear gunshots from inside the house. So they go running in guns drawn. Crockett comes in the front door. He comes to the kitchen, turns and looks to his left in the kitchen and he sees Ray standing on top of a freezer with his gun drawn, firing it into the freezer. And he says, I think I got I got him. He's inside of here. I knew this is where he was going to hit. And you got to think like him. You got to talk like him. He's just firing his gun in there. The Miami PD come in and grab him, awkwardly handcuff him. It was very awkward because there was trying to act, but then they, they were supposed to lift him up and set him down. You can see in the scene, but they didn't have him right, and so Ray was nervous about falling. Yeah, so, I know. What <laughs> <laughs> you get for using real cops, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> they, they normally do something else with their suspects. That's what they do. <laughs> Crockett opens up the freezer, and the freezer is empty. So Ray, it's really clear now that Ray just needs to go to a mental institution. There's something really off about this guy. If Gray was smarter too, he would have checked the freezer for steak and known there's no steak. There's no <laughs> the guy's definitely not in there. <laughs> I think this is supposed to indicate for later when Crockett says he's got this feeling like he's figured out his code and where he's going to hit next that Ray did figure it out. He yeah, just got there before the burglar. Yeah, because that's the, that is the lady. Remember, uh-huh. she's in the she's out there like I don't know. He's in my kitchen and he's got a gun. It's the lady. Yeah. I think, isn't it? Or am I wrong? No, I, I don't is. think he goes back to that house. Oh, okay. She because exactly the she's same. got brown hair. Especially with that both blondes. Maybe. Either Maybe. Way, yeah, I don't but remember. But yeah, but I don't think it's the same, same lady. Yeah, yeah. Because I think they used the same house throughout the whole episode. <laughs> Lazy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't want to move the camera to a new house. Come on. Do we have to? <laughs> now we get a great burglar montage <laughs> of him looking like a bug floating around a light bulb and then having flashbacks to the burglary that he did where he stole the pants. Those <laughs> damn pants are so nice. We learned a lot from this. One, we learned why Shadow, the the actor playing Shadow, never became famous. Um, <laughs> he never got any work after this either. <laughs> yes. Uh, so we also learned that he also hates socks. And so maybe that's why Sonny starts to have such a connection with him. <laughs> when we leave from this fish moment around this light bulb inside of his house, we head over back to the precinct and the duo is with Castillo. And Castillo's face, because he never pulls his face out of his hand. He's got his face in his hand the entire time. It's just Castillo's just like, I am really done with this bullshit. Like, he's done. It's, just, it's, like, he's not even, it's like some guy who goes around and steals steaks. <laughs> he's got other things to do. Cahill, he says that Cahill has called Ray's wife. She hasn't heard from him in weeks. So Ray is, he's gone off and they should have seen this coming, which is kind of a pathetic thing when it comes to the Miami PD is that they were letting Ray run around the streets while he's completely psychotic. Yeah. And then Crockett starts to mumble around like ray may have been on to something single family homes have a certain look although he always goes to the kitchen always gets the meat because he's the meat slapper <laughs> <laughs> and he's moving closer to his victims that that's what each one of these steps is that he's going to move closer and closer until he actually kills someone and then crockett just leaves he said enough <laughs> <laughs> So He's done his I, job. I want to point out something, to something Tubbs mentions about because they're talking about the case and he mentions that he has a 10D sneaker size. What um, the hell is that? What's <laughs> what? The, yeah. 
What the hell's the D for? I, I know they number shoe sizes, but yeah. I don't remember them putting letters. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a 10W, which would be wide, because believe me, I've seen those shoes. <laughs> I was looking at those for our son, um, but I didn't know. But what's the what's the D know. for? I don't know. Maybe it's some weird uh, European uh, thing. Something something Jamaican, maybe. <laughs> Jamaican. <laughs> yeah. I mean, also though, your shoe size like a lot of people have the same shoe size that you can't like you can't use yeah. that in forensics. Is that supposed to be big, small? Maybe the D I, is something I, weird. I don't know. Yeah, maybe. Do my shoes have a letter attached to them too? Am I like a ten G? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Now we're going to head over to Crockett's boat, and he's obsessing over the case now. So we went from Crockett not interested to Crockett totally engrossed in this case in a matter of seconds. Literally. <laughs> <laughs> he's looking through all the files. He clearly stays up all night because then it kind of merges over to this scene where he's sitting at a restaurant, and Castillo comes walking by in the morning, and he sees Crockett there still drinking. Crockett's drunk, been up all night. Castillo... Is like, I'll get you a coffee. And Crockett's like, no, nah, just make it one for you, Castillo. Castillo's like, no, nah, make it zero. And he just leaves on him. <laughs> Castillo's like, yeah, listen, I don't yeah. have time like, for this like, shit. <laughs> I don't care about you. Yeah. Castillo's getting creeped out by Crockett. Like, ooh, okay, I'm leaving. <laughs> because Crockett's talking about, like, you need to think like him. And you can't find the answer to this kind of thing in a book. And, and he has the answer. He keeps saying, like, the answer's within him. The answer's within him. Or whatever. And this kind of just blends over to where Crockett then drunk drives in his <laughs> Porsche. Because Castillo just lets him, he just lets him be there all yeah. drunk. Yeah, I don't know. That didn't make any so, sense for Castillo. I I'm going to address that at the end of this next scene. But I do want to point out at the beginning of this scene. Um, does it? So the Lambo's only got one side mirror. Did, did he lose a mirror? <laughs> no, it has one of those mirrors that folds in. Like those mirrors well, fold just, in. Uh, well, you can see on the driver's side, it's got a side mirror, but there's no side mirror on the passenger huh. side. Weird. And maybe, maybe that's it's just strange. the way that car is. Okay, so back to Jeff R. Sun Street. <laughs> Yeah, Crockett heads out to his neighborhood. He finds some drawings in the street. There's drawings all over street signs and on this weird wall. And then this bushman just jumps out and scares Crockett. Crockett pulls his gun, but then he wakes up at his desk and he, he was just in a dream. So when did the dream start? I don't know. That's, that's a good question. That's what I was going to say. When I, I was just looking through stuff for the episode, they had mentioned that I, I guess... Us as a viewer have to decide if the coffee scene was also part of the dream or uh, if that actually happened. We're not, they don't let us know. So it's kind of left up to us to decide. So, and I also want to point out, they, the reason I call it Jeff R. Sun Street is because the street <laughs> sign literally says Jeff and there's no ER for Jefferson. It, it's Jeff, capital R, Sun Street. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. Jeff Miami. R. Sun <laughs> <Florida>. Street. <laughs> they, 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 they got the street sign. They're like, oh, man, they screwed it up. Well, <laughs> screw it. We can't take it back. This is just what it is Gotta now. Use it. <laughs> <laughs> After Crockett comes to, he jumps up and looks at a map and then makes a phone call. And that's where the B team and the ladies and tubs, they all meet him out at that exact same spot that he had in his dream. There's nothing there. They've walked around. They've walked around and looked at everything. There's nothing there. No, nothing suspicious. And they're all just kind of staring at Crockett like, all right, bro. Like now we're starting to get concerned for you. And Crockett says, now nah, forget it. Let's just get out of here. He gets in the car with tubs and he asks tubs. Like, do you think I'm crazy? And tubs basically walks around without saying no. But without saying yes. Yeah. yeah, he dodges the question. Yes. <laughs> He's like, so, I think you're, you're also, like asleep. <laughs> also, to, to note, Crockett in the Lambo was part of the dream sequence. So this whole episode, Tubbs has been driving him around. Crockett is actually not driven anywhere on his own. Tubbs has had to drive his ass around. At this point, Tubbs has got to be like, get this crazy guy <laughs> out of my car. <laughs> what is it? He's jumping him? He's chomping. It's chomping, chomping him. around. Yeah, he's just chomping him. Chomping around. <laughs> so why you gotta chomp me like yeah, this? Yeah, dude. It. 
and the girls and, and the girls in Zwitek, uh definitely weren't feeling it. No, Zito, he wasn't invited. Zito wasn't invited to any part in the episode. No, no, that's not weird. <laughs> it's not weird that he's only been no. in like one episode this season or two episodes. So. No. Anyways, when we zoom out, <laughs> anyways, the burglar is actually inside of someone's house. He turns the corner and there's a woman in her bed. She sees him and just screams. And then we we cut to the hospital and they're talking now the duo is talking to a doctor the doctor says that the shadow man tried to rape her but couldn't or yeah, didn't he, or whatever he have you do it and then the doctor he says couldn't. she didn't have any she didn't have any steak in the fridge <laughs> and she wasn't wearing men's pants and it was just it just the situation just wasn't right <laughs> So the woman, played by Diana James, she's credited as playing young woman in this episode <laughs> uh, because we never actually learn her name. Because they never ask well, her. Well, and pretty much, yeah, pretty much uh, all of her roles are very similar. She doesn't play people whose names are important. <laughs> <laughs> she played the girl in the pickup in the movie Rudy. She played the police supervisor in Die Hard. She played the hooker in Action Jackson. See, I told you that was going to come up again. <laughs> she was also the girl in the bar in Caddyshack. She played a squeaky waitress in No Holds Bar, which is a Hulk Hogan movie. I have. I already know who she is now. I've seen that movie. <laughs> yes. So she also played Leona's friend in Predator 2, which is actually another reoccurring theme in our guest stars. It was someone else who was in Predators 2. The only time she ever had a name of a character was in the movie Alien Nation, where she played Tease. One name. Oh. So at the hospital, the doctor makes the classic mistake, which is to leave Tubbs and Crockett unsupervised. Yeah, he tells them, like, don't go victim. in there. Don't go in there. She needs, you know, to rest, basically. They basically go in there and Crockett takes his opportunity to berate her. Yeah, he's like hounding her. And then Tubbs is like, hey, Crockett, knock it off. I mean, yeah. I was with this two seconds ago, but that one question you just asked was too far. <laughs> <laughs> they get nothing out of here. There's no help. Crockett does push it too far. Tubbs has to call him back, but they don't really get anything. We have a fast scene where we jump over to the burglar's house and he's just hanging out. <laughs> Doing his thing. <laughs> <laughs> Next, we go back to the precinct. The duo are reviewing everything with Castillo again, and Crockett's starting to lose his shit, but he's right. He's right about the details in this. He likes to slide in glass doors. He goes in through the kitchen. And while he's describing this, there's like a montage of the shadow man doing those actions that Crockett is talking about. So he's nuts, but he's right, which is exactly what Ray was. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I think Crockett's about who 30 seconds away from shooting the freezer. <laughs> Castillo walks and Crockett follows him and, Ca and Crockett's still going over all this crazy stuff. Castillo's like, look, we're sending this back to burglary. And Crockett flips. I'm so close. I understand this guy better than I than anyone else. I know his work now. And Castillo says, I know when a good cop needs to back out. But then so he I, continues I, yeah, I to investigate Castillo this gets case. It. The, the, this is a very important case. You know, there's meat fondling involved. <laughs> I mean, I, I just can't believe Castillo's going to sweep meat fondling and pants stealing <laughs> under the rug. So naturally, when Crockett leaves from the precinct after being told this is going back to burglary, he goes and starts coating lipstick and flour and then rubbing the flour on his face. <laughs> It's a natural transition. Yeah, I think he does that anyway. That's that's why he's so into this case. <laughs> what we don't see is him changing into women's clothing and or as <laughs> what you don't Crockett see is knows him it, is Saturday doing, night. <laughs> doing the same stuff to Elvis too, right? Elvis has to watch all this. The Elvis is just like, let me have that steak. <laughs> <laughs> the next day the duo are parked out in that neighborhood again. Crockett's just kind of stumbling around. Tubbs is flipping a coin, just bored out of his mind. And Crockett says he just has this weird feeling. He says he wants pictures of all the houses on the street, and he's just got this weird feeling that this is the place. All of this is based on his feeling. Just because yeah. he thinks he understands the burglar, no evidence to work off of. He just thinks that he understands him. And poor Tubbs is stuck babysitting him this whole episode <laughs> and he's starving just he like eat just... <laughs> when yeah, they leave... so i mean and then when they leave and they're driving crockett's like babbling on about how they they we need every cop from every department and we need to hide in trash cans and in bushes <laughs> and it'll take three weeks but we'll catch the meat fondler i swear <laughs> to god 
it, the only thing that helps us is that the phone call interrupts that conversation is downtown to say that they got the prowler. So then the duo race over to them and c- pop in in the middle of the interrogation. And it's just some random crazy dude. They found him sleeping in someone's house. And Crockett turns to Cahill on the, the other side of the glass and just says through his teeth, that's not the guy. And then leaves. So Crockett's, Crockett is just leaving people hanging all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> you don't get yeah. a chance to so, respond to anything Crockett says in this episode. I don't believe I've said it yet, but Captain Cahill, played by Ed Longer, who is credited with over 200 film and TV credits. He was in both of the Longest Yard movies, and the only other one that was in both of them was Burt Reynolds. Actually, originally a stand-up comedian, and his first actual acting role was in a Broadway show called The Great White Hope in 1968. His other movies where we would know him from are King Kong, Born on the Fourth of July, 13 Days. He played mobster number three in Leaving Las Vegas. <laughs> he was also in Death Wish 3, which no one saw, so you wouldn't know him from that. <laughs> but he was actually in uh, something interesting. He was actually in Alfred Hitch- Hitchcock's last movie called Family Plot. And Hitchcock liked him so much, he was going to have him star in his next movie be called The Short Night. But Hitchcock... Hmm. Uh, passed away, and they actually never made it. Like you get in with Alfred Hitchcock, you get a movie in with him. He loves you, and then then he died. That's it. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That yeah. Sucks. Now we bounce back to the precinct, and Crockett is again talking to Castillo. He's telling Castillo, "It's the wrong guy. It's not the right person." And Castillo, to his credit, says, "Well, then prove it. Prove it. We have evidence to say that it's the right guy because he was locked. He was in this house. The Miami PD are going to report that they've captured the burglar, so they're feeling pretty good." And Crockett just keeps talking about that. It's just how he feels. Castillo then says he's got orders from downtown. They, they're pulling everyone off the case. This investigation is done. Before he's able to tell Crockett to get lost, he gets a phone call, though. And it's Gilmore calling, or the hospital calling where Gilmore's at. And he wants to see Crockett because he's received some mail. So Crockett races out to go over to the mental institution where they're keeping Ray. When they come in, he what he has is a drawing on newspaper from the burglar. But the newspaper, because Tubbs is with him, because as you mentioned, John, Tubbs is babysitting Crockett throughout this whole episode. He's a chaperone. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. That the newspaper is from after they caught the man that they currently think is their prime suspect. So it can't be him. They have this mail that proves that's from after. So at this point, I think what they should do is invest in a psychic or a Ouija board. (laughs) Back downtown. Cahill is saying the case is closed unless the lab, who has the newspaper now and and the drawing, unless they can say otherwise. But otherwise, it's shutting down. You can't put any more people into it, especially if just investigated it because Crockett has a case of, quote, the vibes. <laughs> <laughs> That's bad when you get that, though. <laughs> Crockett storms out. Cahill tells Castillo to get him under control or he's going to suspend Crockett. So now it's getting real serious for Crockett, too. But Castillo doesn't seem to take it too seriously because outside, Crockett says that the burglar is going to coming is coming tonight. Castillo does tell him he's off duty, but then he tells Tubbs to babysit him. It's like, isn't that what Tubbs has been doing already? Yeah, I know. Yeah, shouldn't someone <laughs> take Crockett's gun at this point? Yeah. <laughs> or lock him up or something. I don't know. <laughs> Tubbs and Crockett head over to a restaurant and Crockett's looking through pictures and he holds up one of them and says, this is the one, this is the house that he's going to hit next. Tubbs hasn't been listening to him. He's just like, whatever you nutso, I'm not listening to anything you say right now. Tubbs finally does call him crazy and Crockett storms out again because you're not allowed to respond to him. He's going to blurt something out and then run away. <laughs> <laughs> but he would be worse to deal out with Tubbs. They're going to go see Ray and if Ray picks the same picture as him, if they can play Guess Who together, then they will go <laughs> investigate Crockett's lead. <laughs> the creepiest game of guess who ever guess who fondles the meat it's a picture of a guy oh, holding it. a so, <laughs> yeah we we see in the next scene and he's got all of the pictures laid out on the table and ray's like comatose sitting there and then pretty much crockett like like he he 
He blinked. He blinked. He meant this picture <laughs> and grabs it and slaps it against the window. And my favorite part of this scene is that when he slaps it in the window, the camera pulls back and you see Tubbs and Castillo in behind like the window. And neither one of them are paying attention to <laughs> <No>. <laughs> uh, Gilmore or Crockett. Castillo's got his hand in his face and Tubbs is like looking at his watch. Like, oh, look, Crockett thinks he's right. OK, uh, take him to the house. Yeah, just go on it anyway. So you think they call for backup here, but no, they just head out. Just Tubbs and Crockett head out to the house here. At this point in the episode, I'm thinking, well, maybe if Crockett starts breaking in the houses in a couple weeks, he'll have it down and he'll bump into them, you know? <laughs> when they head out to the house, it's clearly the exact same house and the exact same scene from earlier in the episode where Crockett first starts to lose it. He's like, I think I figured it out. He always does the same thing. And so he's talking about it. And then there's this montage of the Shadow Man doing it. Because it's the same gate, the same backyard, and the same door has been removed. And I'm they starting to think that th this isn't an epidemic. That this guy just keeps breaking into the same house. And he's just got a <laughs> grudge against the, these people that live there. You know? He's not funneling other people's meat. He's just funneling one person's meat. <laughs> This lady starts coming down the stairs in her house, and then she turns the corner, and the shadow man just screams and starts running at her at night. And luckily, though, Crockett has run in through the back door. He tackles shadow man before he gets to her and then starts beating the fuck out of him. He pummels him. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Dude. Which, two points. One, that was a lucky break. Crockett didn't call crap. He got lucky. Number two, like, I just pictured the, uh, the shadow guy yelling, like, Where's the pants? <laughs> <laughs> Tubbs comes running in and Crockett desperately turns to the woman, pulls out his badge and just has this look of like a psychotic breakdown on his face. Like, no, I'm a cop. It's OK. I'm a cop. Before we leave from here, we see that the cops have pulled the burglar outside. They put him in the back of the car. He's got this creepy smile on his face when they put him in the back of that car, too. Like. I'm thoroughly creeped out by that man, by yeah, the way. Yeah, he is creepy. <laughs> yeah. Did I mention he was a Bible movie? <laughs> That's even more creepy. <laughs> and now we head to our last scene. Now it's a short scene. You see inside of the room that the Miami PD are interrogating our shadow man. He's nuts. He's talking about all kinds of wacky ass stuff. Outside of the room, Castillo tells Sonny that he's on desk duty. He's burned out. Cro Crockett's admitting it, but saying he doesn't really need any time off. He's just saying he's really tired. And then inside the interrogation room, the burglar says he knows he's sick. And then he turns and looks and his face lines up with Crockett's reflection in the glass. Then he stands up and throws something through the window. And that causes Crockett to wake up from another dream and then the episode ends it was yeah, all a dream so... <laughs> it was in a dream inside of a dream because we already had him wake up from one dream like an inception <laughs> i really hope that's not what they meant was that it was all this one big crazy nightmare dream because if it is shame on you miami vice shame <laughs> on you copying dallas no nope. yeah exactly <laughs> Exactly. Dallas did it, and then no one else really, it, like, that was it. Like, oh, that was interesting once. Like, every <laughs> other show that's, that does that, oh, but it doesn't mean anything because it, it, it's all a dream. And so we just go back to normal. Well, that was a wasted episode. <laughs> well, yeah, and this would be just months after Dallas had done it. Like, this is, and yep. now they're competing directly with Dallas in a time slot, so. Hey, that's like a slap in the face to Dallas. Wait a minute. No. <laughs> Bobby's way more important than some shadow guy. <laughs> <laughs> the only reason I know about that dream sequence in Dallas is because I want to say Family Guy I was say or the Simpsons. Family yeah, yeah, yeah family, family, guy. family Guy. They spoofed it. Yeah. Yeah. They actually showed like them as the, the actual people that were in the real show. At yeah. the end, it, it was like it was Patrick Duffy and, and I, I can't uh, remember Victoria, what Victoria. I think I remember her name. Yeah. Principal. Victoria Principal. Mm -hmm. That's her name. I'll say, just lead up for, for, for my final thoughts. I, I enjoyed this episode, but for different reasons than maybe what the episode intended. I don't know. It might have been, but I thought this episode was okay. It was a little weird for being on Miami Vice, but what I think of, it's a Halloween episode, and they did a pretty good job of being creepy. The only downfall is, is that Crockett goes from zero to completely freaking insane real fast. Too fast, I think. Speaking of weird, <laughs> let's go talk about this music because we have some very unique artists this week in the music section. Okay, John, 
this week's music. I'm happy you're back for music because we're actually going to get a li- a music segment that's going to be worth listening to, unlike mine from last week. But I'm also happy you're here because <laughs> I would have never been able to put together information on these bands that appeared in this episode. This is a weird one. Really? So like you don't know the famous Brian Eno? No. <laughs> How do you not know Brian Eno? So we start off music with Two Rapid Formations by Brian Eno. Born Brian Peter George Eno. And the reason I bring that up is that the other name that he goes by, according to Wikipedia, was Brian Peter George St. John La Baptiste de la (laughs) Sally Eno. Which I think (laughs) someone's just screwing with his Wikipedia. (laughs) Someone thought that was funny. (laughs) <laughs> so, if that's serious, this guy has problems. So, uh, he's an English musician, producer, and visual artist, among other things. Basically, his starting music, he started out with the band, the glam rock band Roxy Music. Uh, he played the synthesizer uh, for them for two years, recorded two albums with them, and then he left the band over disagreements with lead singer Brian Ferry and because he thought rock star life was quite boring. <laughs> wow, so he's one of those people. He's a musical yeah. hipster, basically. Dude, totally. In 73, he started going like his solo route and he kind of coined the concept of ambient music, which it's just kind of uh, around. <laughs> I, yeah, just I, I record the sounds of stuff. You know, <laughs> I, I can just picture him. He, he's the guy who's like following people around in the supermarket, like recording the sound of their shopping cart. And that's what he considers <laughs> music. He recorded four albums in the mid to late 70s. But what he is most or what he probably most notable for is is the stuff that he produced as a record producer. He collaborated with a bunch of different artists. So there were the artsy ones, like Harold Budd, who's a pianist and a poet. But he also collaborated with Genesis in the early Genesis, you know. God damn you, Phil Collins. Yes. He sneaks (laughs) in. He sneaks into this one. But he also... Get, you know who else is starting to sneak in all my damn musics? David Bowie. David <laughs> Bowie, he recorded it, or well, he wrote and performed as a musician on David Bowie's Berlin Trio albums from 77 to 79 and was directly involved with the song I'm Afraid of Americans, which is actually one of my favorite David Bowie songs. <laughs> as So during the 70s, his career kind of, while he was doing his own thing, he was working as a record producer. He worked on albums for The Talking Heads, Devo. I mean, and then as you go further and further into the 80s and 90s, he co-produced U2's The Unforgettable Fire, Joshua Tree, A Tongue Baby, and All That You Can't Leave Behind. So basically, Damn. all of U2's good music. Yeah, so he's definitely yeah. more successful as a producer yeah so getting back into his stuff he composed and performed the theme the prophecy theme david lynch's movie dune and then on top of that in 94 he was hired by microsoft to compose the six second music startup sound for windows 95's operating system known as the microsoft sound yes brian eno do you not dun, know Brian Eno dun, now? Dun, dun, dun. Yes. Wow. That's probably the most profitable thing he's ever made, too. Oh, oh, dude, it launched an entire section of his career that I'm just going to briefly talk about because it's boring. But that's when he got into what he what was referred to as generative music, basically generic sound bites. So when you buy a new phone and you have those generic like uh, ring, ring tones tones, and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Like, he was at the forefront of that when it comes to, like, the the stuff on your computer. Like, when you had Windows 95 and you had those generic tones that went with the screen save, that was Brian Eno. Wow. Yes. So now you know Brian Eno. He still produces records and, and all of that, but he is still very much involved in ringtones and uh, just generic sound bites. 
So. I would say too that if you're looking for a good time, go look up videos from Microsoft in the mid '90s and look for like their conferences and stuff. You have lots of quality videos of Bill Gates dancing on stage. <laughs> the as, way he dances too, <laughs> as '90s Bill Gates. So like polo underneath a striped sweater. <laughs> There's also a great video of him trying to <laughs> showing that he can jump over a chair. <laughs> so just on a side note, uh, I mentioned U2 and how Brian Eno worked with U2. One of my favorite Bill Gates stories is that U2, Bono, the lead singer of U2, was visiting Bill Gates. And Bill Gates picked him up in a minivan with his family at the airport. <laughs> Like, that's just the, my favorite thing ever. I could just see Bill Gates in one of those sweater vests in, in, in like a 96 Dodge Caravan with his whole family in there picking up Bono at the airport. <laughs> driving back out to his big ass mansion. It's the most Seattle thing I've ever heard. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yes. So moving on, we get to Tierra Dura by Ruben Blades. Ruben Blades, born Ruben Blades Bellado de Luna. So I want to give his parents credit that they actually included Blades as his middle name. <laughs> that, that's pretty. That's pretty badass. <laughs> so he's a Panamanian singer, songwriter, actor, activist, and politician, and he is actually very. He's one of the most incredible. I. I I guess I should say his bio is one of the more incredible bios I've ever read. Just to start out, uh, to get an idea of who this guy is, he plays Daniel Salazar on the TV show Fear the Walking Dead. What? Yes. Now you're listening. <laughs> Let's learn a little bit about him. He earned degrees in political science and law at Univ Universidad Nacional de Panama, 1974. He began his formal music career in New York, writing songs while working in the mailroom at Fania Records. This led him to collaborate with trombonist and band leader Willie Colon. So, and Willie Colon actually is a huge name as far as salsa music is concerned. Ruben Blades and Willie Colon recorded several albums together. He also wrote and performed several songs with the Fania All-Stars. And the Colon and Blades album, Siembra, Siembra, in 1978 is the best-selling salsa record in history, selling over 25 million records. Wow. Okay. I had no idea this is where we were going with this man because when I looked up his music on YouTube, there wasn't really much to find. And I anticipated someone like Ho Hum and the whole thing with the whole music segment, I expected it to be this, but you are blowing my mind right now. Over 25 million records. He has eight Grammys, five Latin Grammys, and a few Emmys. Wow. Okay. Yes. In 1984, he signed with Electro Records when he formed when he was formed his own big band. That is right around the time when he recorded his first Grammy Award-winning album. In 1982, he got his first acting role in the film The Last Fighter, which is about a singer-turned-boxer vying for a championship. And the guy he fights against was played by a real-life champ, Salvador Sanchez. So you think this guy's impressive enough, right? Right? Well, here we mm -hmm. turn again. 1985, he earned his master's degree in international law from Harvard Law School. This um, man is unstoppable. Yes. In 1988, he released an English collaboration, uh, collab uh, collaboration called Nothing But The Truth with rock artists Sting, Elvis Costello, and Lou Reed. In 97, he headed the cast of Paul Simon first Broadway musical, The Cape Man, also starring Mike Anthony. So, and I promised you a Predator 2 reference. His other films were Predator 2, The Color of Night, and Once Upon a Time in Mexico, among others. Wow. And even more impressive, this man, in 1994, ran for the president of Panama, <laughs> but he failed to win the vote. He, he achieved 18% of the vote. Wow. To give you an idea why that's impressive, Ralph Nader is probably the biggest third-party person to run for president. That, that wasn't a major party. Yeah. In the 2000 election, Ralph Nader received 2.74% of the popular vote. <laughs> Wow. Ruben Blades made it to 18%. In <laughs> yeah. 2004, he was appointed a uh, Minister of Tourism and was, and served out a five-year term in Panama. So, yeah, so uh, he still held office. Yes. 
he still held office. And most recently in 2015, his album Tangos won a Grammy for Best Latin Pop Album. He's still doing it, people. <laughs> and he has said that he plans to run for president of Panama in 2019. Damn, now I'm going to have to pay attention to the Panamanian election. Yes. So, yeah, one of the more interesting bios that I've ever gone through. I mean, he is a Harvard freaking lawyer. He has a master's in international law, among other things. He's, he's acting in one of the most popular TV shows right now. In 2015, he won a freaking Grammy. He's still doing it music-wise. He has the he, he was involved in the best-selling salsa album of all time. Yeah. So I mean, just, just amazing. And he has a solid chance of he's held office in Panama, and he has a solid chance based on previous votes that maybe he could get something together. That might become the freaking president or pr premier or prime minister, or whatever they have in Panama, and actually be in charge of the it, entire it's the presidency. Country. Yeah, being in charge of the entire country. Wow. Well, there's your music. <laughs> this went somewhere I was not expecting. And again, proves that I should not be trusted with the music segment. <laughs> 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 Let's go break down our final thoughts on this episode. All right, John, we missed you last week. We're going to let you kick off this week's final rundown. What are your final thoughts on this episode? My, th my final thoughts... Are, it was a strange episode, and it was kind of cool with the just having that kind of creepy theme to the episode. I just I I, I felt it was just lacking one thing. I mean, the the bad guy was creepy, but I I don't find meat fondling or pants stealing <laughs> scary. I just wish this guy was like a more hardcore criminal. Crockett was gonna lose his mind trying to catch someone. Let it be a murderer or a rapist, not a guy fondling meat. <laughs> um, and I get they're trying to channel this serial killer from Sacramento, but there's a lot of serial killers. It, it, it's, it's easy to be make a serial killer creepy. I just wish that the overall character that the that they were chasing or the overall bad guy they were chasing was actually a bad guy and not just some Looney Tune who would who walks in and steals people's pants. Like yeah. that was the only thing missing in this episode for me was an actual villain, you know, because I think Crockett losing his freaking mind was cool. Um, and <laughs> the only cool. other thing, uh, the, well, I, I, I mean, it like it played well in the episode with it. The only other thing that was lacking that, that kind of made me mad was at the end, how it was kind of like, like it was a dream sequence, like the whole Dallas thing. I could have gone without that. I could have just gone. The whole episode ended with the crazy guy in the interrogation room and then Crockett just like staring off freeze frame. But no, mm -hmm. we had to do the whole wake up again. So like you fix those two things and this is a fantastic episode. But without those two things... You know, it, it it was okay. You know, I would I think I'm a bigger fan of this episode than anyone else in the group because I actually really did like it. And I agree with you that maybe the criminal could have been more hardcore. It kind of led to the story that he was building to his first kill. So they were trying to catch him before he actually did it. The thing that bugged me the most was just how fast Crockett snapped. And I understand it's a single episode. So they had to do a lot of setup to get to him where he, fi he finally gets obsessed with this case. But it does happen pretty quickly. But otherwise, like, I was thoroughly creeped out putting it together as a Halloween episode and they're trying to creep you out with it. Like, it worked for me. I it still had some Miami High Life stuff to it. We still had uh, normal Mi Miami Vice stuff. Castillo was kind of because he was we actually had more Castillo in this episode that, than we've had in a long time. Even if there was a whole scene, he never took his face out of his hand. So, <laughs> so maybe that's how so it Dom, about this episode. <laughs> so, Dom, quick question then. Was Greg Gilmore's character necessary? I think he was because it set the tone for the episode that there was already one police officer that went crazy. And then you watch Crockett follow the same path. So I think that okay. Ray was important for setting up the episode so that you knew you, you basically watched Crockett going down the same path. And then you were just hoping that something was going to happen before he finally went totally off the deep end because without that he wouldn't have been 
that it would Crockett wouldn't make any sense. Him going yeah. crazy like that wouldn't make any sense at all. The wheelchair scene was probably unnecessary. <laughs> yeah, slightly. <laughs> <laughs> but all in all, I really liked the episode. I thought it was creepy. I thought they did a good job. I I was pretty locked into it. There's a couple of plot holes, but all in all, it's pretty good. Melissa, what are your final thoughts? Well, I mean, I think I already told you this, but I don't like this episode, and, and I didn't like it when I watched it the, the first you know, however many times I've watched it. But I did not remember until we watched it today that it was a Halloween episode. So that does change my opinion on it in a little bit because it is eerie. It's not scary, but it's creepy and it's eerie. And it makes perfect sense that it would be on for Halloween. And it was still on, I think Family Ice was on at like 10 o'clock. So it would still be on at a decent time, not to be too creepy. And there was no actual real blood or anything. They didn't show anything that would be too scary. So, I mean, I appreciate it. I guess that's what it is. I appreciate it more now that I know it was a Halloween episode. But other than that, I have no... <laughs> it has no redeeming qualities to me. I could have gone without it. Um, I mean, once again, like, I think it was funny that when I told you, I'm like, well, pre-show, I'm like, well, you know, it's, it's one of the episodes, like, it, I don't like it because they show Crockett and he gets, like, too deep. And you're like, isn't that every episode with Crockett? <laughs> Doesn't he do that with everything? He takes everything too serious? So, I mean, I don't know. It's not my favorite episode, but I appreciate it more. And I and now I see like a connection. I'm like, okay, that makes a lot more sense. I think that the fact that they use the same house over and over again is kind of a cop out. And I'm with John. I think the dream thing is overplayed. They've done this so many dream sequences in so many shows. Yeah. And it just it just takes away all the merit of the show right then. And that would be for sure what I agree with both of you guys on. And I think we're all in agreement. Like the dream stuff wasn't necessary and it didn't add anything to it. It just added this layer of confusion. It would be better either A, if it was totally a dream or if it wasn't a dream at all. Obviously, the best is if it was if there was no dream sequences. But commit. Don't do this half-assed crap where it's, is it a dream? Is it not a dream? When did the dream start? Like, no, no, no. Is it a dream or is it not a dream? Yeah, don't leave it up to the viewer to uh, interpret it. You should just have a yeah. A, a, I, yeah. At, at that point, you might as well just make it a clip show. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, well, that's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Again, this was season three, episode six, titled The Shadow in the Dark. And I'm going to say it again the Halloween episode. <laughs> <laughs> Go out, people. Go to YouTube. Check out Siembra by The Cullen and Blades and enjoy some fantastic salsa. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And learn, read more about Ruben Blades because that man is taking over the world. Be sure to check out the website, goalwiththeheat.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us, goalwiththeheat at gmail.com. Let us know what your thoughts are on this episode. And if you think that it being a Halloween episode has anything that changes your opinion on this episode, let us know. Email us, goalwiththeheat at gmail.com. Go to our website, goalwiththeheat.com. Click on About Us. You can find all the ways that you can contact us, including Twitter, Tumblr, Facebook, how you can connect with each one of us individually. You can also check out our YouTube channel if that's easier for you to listen to it on there. We're also on TuneIn, iTunes, Google Play. You can pretty much find us anywhere. We hope you enjoy this episode and we'll see y'all next time. Bye, pals.